Born in Seoul, Korea, and raised in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Ji Lee studied design at Parsons in New York City. He is currently the communications designer at Facebook and was previously creative director at Google Creative Lab, branding director at Droga5, and art director at Saatchi & Saatchi. Ji Lee is the founder of the widely publicized Bubble Project and the author of two books, Talk Back, The Bubble Project, and Universe Revolved, A Three-Dimensional Alphabet. Lee's work has appeared in ABC World News, The New York Times, Newsweek, The Guardian, and Wired, among others. In 2011, he was named one of, 50, one of the 50 most influential designers in America by Fast Company. Please enjoy G. Lee. Bonsoir, Maria. And that's how far my French goes. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for coming here. It's very cold outside. Uh, it's my big pleasure to be here, my first time in, in Montreal. I've been to Canada a few times, in Toronto, Vancouver, but this is my very first time, and I'm, so far I'm enjoying it very much. So hopefully I can come back some other time as well. Um, so I was preparing my talk over the weekend, and uh, yesterday, uh, a friend of mine pinged me on Facebook and said, hey, dude, you're number one in uh, uh, trending on Reddit. So I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. So I went to Reddit, and this is what I saw. Number one, I made a redundant clock. I thought, well, that's really cool. That's an old project of mine, and I, something that I've done 20 years ago as a student, studying graphic design at Parsons. And I clicked the link and I saw this. And I thought, that's not really the design I made because my original design looked like this. Similar, but not really exactly the same. So I felt strange about it, but I, and then I clicked the, the publisher's uh, comment and this is what he wrote. All credit goes for the original design goes to Julie, design and blah, 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 check other website. So he obviously gave the credit. He liked the design that I have done so much that he created his own uh, redundant clock. You know, I made this as a student project, as a junior studying graphic design at Parsons, um, and I did it as a kind of a mock. I never really went after mass production. And I think it tells something about uh, the power of personal projects, which I'm here to talk about today, because when you're creating personal project which comes from your, you know, passion, something that you have to release when you have something inside. Um, <laughs> it really, I think, there's some purity in there, and I think people connect to those projects in a different way when you create branded content. Because in the end of the day, you know when you're watching a commercial, although they may be great, incredible, and entertaining, you know that the goal, end goal of the brand, the content is to sell you something, probably something that you don't need. But with personal projects, when people are creating these projects out of their passion or necessity because they feel they have to do something about themselves or others, there is a purity uh, and there is a, something that just really goes deeper than any uh, commercial project. I think that's the, something about the personal project that we all feel connected to. And for me, the number one reason why I do personal project, same as Armin, is that it's just fun to do. Uh, it's funny that we have exactly the same word to describe the reason behind personal project. And this all started really, uh, you know, as a child, I always wanted to be in the creative field. So of all the people here who work in the creative field, I would say, who doesn't work in the creative field? Okay, a few people. So if you work in the creative field, um, probably you didn't come to the creative field thinking you're going to make a lot of money, right? Otherwise, you would have become a doctor or lawyer. We, want to, we came to this field because we had a calling, we had a passion, we were really good at what we were doing. We were all weirdos at some point in our childhood. And I think that's what really drove me as a child to make drawings, and that's what drove me to the art schools. And I didn't even know the term personal project. I did these things, I made 
stuff because they gave me joy and it was fun to do it. And for me, the art school was some of the best time. Uh, four years of doing things that I really wanted to do. There was a very uh, supportive uh, community around teachers and students. And this is uh, one of my very first um, uh, project that I did when I was at Parsons. Um, it's called Word, Word as Image. And the, the assignment was very simple. You had to illustrate the meaning behind the word without adding any other component outside of the word. So you have to sort of visualize the meaning with the typographic uh, element within the word. So that's elevator. Um, the next is diet, fat belly, and tiny food, uh, moon, gravity. And I, you know, the assignment was to come up with, uh, I think, five of those. Uh, it was, uh, you know, sort of the Cooper Hewitt uh, tradition of doing things, and I had so much fun doing this. Um, here's tsunami. There's a clock. This one, uh, anybody has a guess? Hill. <laughs> this is very easy. <laughs> Men's room. And I, it, it was really a lot of fun doing these things. Uh, obviously, I didn't want to do, you know, fall or jump because that's too easy. So I wanted to do something that's a little harder. And it became my um, lifelong project. Uh, I continued to do these projects, and I, it became uh, my insomnia project. Whenever I couldn't sleep, I would think about a word. I tried to come up with a visual solution for that, and I, and I did this for the past 20 years, uh, and a few years ago I was able to publish a book. Um, and it, again, it wasn't for the money, it was purely for the fun and the challenge of cracking something. And here is the, the video uh, that uh, I worked with the uh, animator and sound designer together. So let's see if it plays. Thank you. 
so I, after I graduated from Parson, I went into design field, and I uh, worked doing corporate identities and annual reports, uh, design books, and etc. And I really wanted to get into advertising. I grew up in Brazil, and some of the best commercials are made in Brazil. I thought it was really fun and conceptual, and a large scale. So I finally had a break to go into advertising because of my personal projects and school uh, projects that I did at Parsons. Um, and I worked at a big agency for four years, and it was uh, everything that I expected to be to the amazing agency world was nothing like that. Uh, it was, you know, the pay was great, uh, that was the nice part, but the work itself was very, uh, very slow, everything was getting tested, uh, you know, any idea that would uh, be risky or any idea that would be experimental end up, ended up getting killed, either by the agency folks or by the clients. And during these four years of really trying to produce something that I thought was in interesting, uh, were getting killed. And it was, I was at a point where, um, you know, it was tempting to stay because the pay was great and the working hours was not so horrible, but the work itself was uh, not that great. And I was getting increasingly frustrated for not being able to produce the work and not being able to have fun as I was having uh, while I was studying. So, it, uh, and I, you know, another thing that was upsetting to me was to see all the crappy work that was getting produced and then occupying every, you know, corner of the streets of New York City. And I felt I was a part of the, the problem that would produce this crappy ads and putting on the streets, and I wanted to do something. So that really, uh, you know, that frustration uh, for me served as an inspiration to do something because I was sort of dying there because I was not able to do anything. And I thought, okay, um, I want to do something for these ads that, on, that I see on the street where people can actually you know, talk back and interact. So I printed uh, 50,000 stickers in the shape of speech bubble, and I went around uh, every, you know, corner, every street of New York, wherever I went, and I placed them on top of ads, and I, you know, and people started to write in, in, inside the bubble stickers, uh, like this one, I steal music, and someone else wrote, and I'm not going away. Um, you know, I used to smoke crack on the sixth train. <laughs> by J-Lo. Um, in India, they are sacred, but this ain't India, bitch, <laughs> by a Snapple commercial. Um, in the beginning, I had no idea uh, that people would actually write something, but I was so surprised that like, five minutes after I put the stickers, I would see something. So I documented. My only rule was that I would never write anything myself. That I would place the stickers, and then people would uh, inst you know, write something and I would take photographs. There were lots of, uh, you know, fuck my pussy, and, you know, that guy's a <laughs> faggot. And that was fine, too, because it's, it's about freedom of expression and giving the people the possibility to, to talk about the advertising they're, they're looking. Uh, I use it to download porn. <laughs> so a lot of it was just people speaking the truth about advertising, you know? Uh, and I think it really exposed, for me, the discrepancy between what people see as ads and also from the advertisers who are making these ads. There's so many miles and miles apart, and I think most of the advertisers talk to themselves instead of really listening to the consumers. So that was really an a eye-opening experience. And that's another one. I lost my other ham to, hum to cancer, another truth about cigarette ads. Um, so, and the bubble project, uh, something that I started on my own, I funded, and I did everything by myself, kind of exploded. And this is, you know, 2009, so a while ago. And it gave me the confidence to, you know, I can really actually create something and put it out there, and it, gets, it may get uh, a lot of exposure and a lot of opportunities. And strangely enough, I got tons of calls from ad agencies whose ads I was defacing asking me to work for them. <laughs> and uh, that gave me the confidence to actually quit my job, uh, and my old job, and freelance for about two years, making good money, and then continue to do personal projects. Basically, I continued to do what I used to do at school, 
things that are developed at schools and just doing it in a way that is much more focused and things that I learned at doing at work, I would apply that. You know, how to promote your work, how to use mass media, how to, you know, how to you know, actually produce the work, funding, and et cetera. So it was really a complementary thing for me. Um, so I made personal project as my life mission, as uh, something that I'll continue to do because it's fun, and also because when I do personal project, I realize always great things happen. Um, you know, I either get opportunity to come to a place like this for free to give a talk, uh, I get job offers, and I get freelance offers, it's, and I, get, I meet tons of interesting people around the world that I've never have met if it wasn't for the personal project. So, so many, many amazing things have happened it, with so many personal projects I've worked on that I, I made that into uh, my life mission. So one of the things that I, I really like to do is just playing with medium. As I work at Facebook, you know, medium is something that I, I think a lot, uh, Facebook being, like it or not, uh, the defining medium of our time. Uh, and one of, one of my projects deal with that. And, and you know, I have personal projects going on, multiple pro personal <coughs> projects going on and, and uh, any given time. So, you know, there is like short-term personal projects, something that I would do over the weekend. There's a mid-term project that I maybe, maybe would take a couple of months, and then long-term projects like the, you know, Warder's Image that took me 15 years. And it's nice to think those projects in those terms, as Armin talked about, deadline. It's, it's sort of a self-guiding principle that, okay, like I can work on a weekend project, ship it, and let that be, but then I have something that is continually continuing to work. So this is one of the short-term projects. Uh, it's called Wide Feed, and it literally took me two minutes to start from beginning to the end. So, you know, as I spend a lot of time on Facebook, uh, it can be sometimes overwhelming experience because I see a lot of interesting content that, you know, is, is in my feed, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice to take a break sometime in that feed? So I thought, okay, maybe I just create a page called Wide Feed, and all I do is to publish white image, <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> so if people like this page, and now it went about 2,000 people who like this page, and I, you know, a couple of times a week, I would just, you know, publish a white image. There's no <laughs> writing, no comments, nothing. And, I, you know, and that's how you see within your feed, white feed has a new photo, there's nothing. It's the easiest project I've ever done. <laughs> And then I started to realize the comments <laughs> always, always come just when I least expect it and appreciate it most. And then a lot of, lot of those, thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> nice wide, my heart is in my mouth. This one is sick, when are you coming out with a wider one? <laughs> I can stop weeping. Um, uh, oh my God, this is awesome, so deep. How I, now I see the twist in the plot, amazing evolution. <laughs> so like, I, it's an amazing experience. <laughs> this is so deep, I totally get it. The emptiness is how in America our youth is constantly intoxicated and all the opportunities they will miss out. I love this one, obviously, it shows the visual impact on the hum humanism hidden in the arts of the late romanticism during Battle on Europe. <laughs> it's beautiful sniff. Here's another example, land grab. Uh, I'm starting Blackfeet, so this person started the Blackfeet. Um, so that all, all he, he does is to, so it's the, you know, it's just, there's no objective. The only objective is to have fun. And, and a, a personal project can be as simple as that, is to realize, okay, I want to have a break in my feed, what can I do? Oh, I'm just going to publish white feed, boom, two minutes, Later, the project is live and the world is seeing that. Uh, so, disrupting medium, playing with medium is certainly an inspiration. Um, mystery is, uh, for me, also a big inspiration because I think we live in a very rational world. Everything gets explained. If you have a question in our mind, you know, back in the day, you had to go to the library and just research, but you have to type something, you can Google it, and everything in your, all the answers in the palm of your hands. 
And now, uh, because of that, I think we have lost a lot of the mystery, you know, that storytelling and the, the things that you saw that you can really figure it out. So that, as an inspiration, uh, I created a project called Mr. Rabbit, uh, and it's, um, there's an interesting story about uh, this world-renowned violin player, Joshua Bell, who played a, a full uh, sonata by Bach, I think, in a train station in D.C., and in this full hour that he played, I think one, st one person stopped to really listen to the music, which I think it says a lot about the life that we live today. We just don't really pay attention to what goes, go what goes on, and all these beautiful things just pass by because we're preoccupied thinking about the future or the past, or we're looking at the phone, always busy, always preoccupied, and we can't really live the moment. So with that in mind, um, and you know, having done Bubble Project and having done something that's illegal, uh, you know, it's, it's I, get, I get a lot of tickets and there's always a danger of police. I wanted to do something that was smaller in scale that without a, a big chance of getting caught by police. So um, we made uh, 10,000 tiny little uh, 3D printed bunnies and uh, we give them away for free so that people can place them in a public space as a, as a gift for a stranger who may be passing by. So for that stra for the stranger who sees that little piece of rabbit, it becomes that you know, piece of mystery. So maybe for two seconds in between commuting, you may see this little piece and you may stop and wonder, like, who put this thing? Why is it, why, what is this thing doing here? Should I take it with me? Should I trash it? So I like that two, three seconds of tension. So, and then, uh, you know, once we start giving them away, we saw a lot of pictures taking, a lot of people taking pictures and posting on the website. The nice thing about this project for me personally was that I started to observe my surrounding more <laughs> and hijacking things like, uh, I think this is Georges Pompidou. Um, it was in Cannes, not sure, but the, because of the, the context, you know, I started to observe the surrounding and, uh, you know, things change scale because the, the rabbit becomes this being and this, this man becomes a giant. Uh, you know, things like this. So it's like it become like an Easter egg hunt for people. <laughs> so there are literally thousands and thousands of photographs. And there is a map, if you go to the mrrabbit.com, that people can actually, um, if you, you know, f take a photo and, and, and on Instagram and hashtag Mr. Rabbit, it automatically plays the, the picture in the map. And since then, it, you know, this is a few years ago, it grew a lot. So it's nice to see uh, this project have a, a life of its own. And people can also download the file and 3D print it and do it on their own themselves. So that's fun. Um, no, hijacking is one of my favorite things to do because uh, all the hard work is done by somebody else. I just take that and then just, you know, change it to something different. So um, it's a really efficient technique for somebody who is lazy in terms of creating something new, like myself. So one of the latest projects uh, is something called Clownif Clownify Stickers. Um, again, um, I had the idea like commuting, I take subway every day and I have to see these terrible ads and I want to do something besides the whole project because it's too dangerous. It became too dangerous for me to place this. So I wanted to dial down the scale, so I printed these uh, stickers and I put it uh, again on top of ads. And it instantly transformed into happy ads. <laughs> you know, they're just a bunch of clowns. <laughs> making ads. So what kind of injury do you think they suffered to call these guys, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> Silicon Valley. <laughs> it just instantly transformed the intention, no, original intent behind the ad, which I love. They're so cool, right? So they're trying so hard to be cool. <laughs> um, and here's another example of, uh, you know, when Apple announced App, uh, iWatch, I think a couple of months ago, 
they said like the, one of the world's most accurate watch. Uh, and I thought, well, this is the world's most accurate watch. <laughs> so I drew it and then I um, you know, put it on my Instagram. Uh, and it was picked up by Huffington Post and thousands of people saw it. And it's, that's what I love about uh, today is because I think you know, 20 years ago when I was studying at Parsons, uh, there was no such thing as internet as we know today. And uh, now I think the internet really leveled the playing field for everyone. So if you have a great idea and if you have, uh, obviously you have the tools, right? You, you, know, you can shoot your movie with your iPhone, you have YouTube and you, can, you have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to, as a channel to publicize that. And I am such a believer that when you do something with your passion and produce something uh, that is, you know, really st coming from your heart, eventually uh, there will be people who are, gonna, who are going to appreciate and your work will get the, the exposure. And that's, for me, what's so liberating to be the d designer and communicator today because the playing level is, is flat and anyone with an idea who is willing to make something can have an impact. So um, here are a few things that I learned uh, while doing personal project. As I talked about when I work on personal project, great things happen. Uh, in a word is image project, I got several calls from people around the world who wanted me to design their logo. Tara Banks called me because they wanted, she wanted me to design logo. It never happened, but it was without those things, without the personal project, I would have not met these people. You know, there's gentlemen in France who wanted me to design a logo for his, uh, for his store, which is a wonderful experience. <coughs> so great things happen. I don't know what, but always great things happen. Um, a personal and professional project can complement each other. So, you know, what things that I learned doing professional projects, uh, I can apply onto personal projects and vice versa. And by doing personal projects, one thing that I learned is that I I get to go to work at great companies who, who really appreciate the work that I do. So I set the tone for the, the level of the places that I want to go work at. And I, I give 100% of the credit to my personal project for the reasons that I ended up going to places like Droga5 and Google and Facebook. And I never call them, you know, they reached out to me because they saw my personal project. So it professionally ended up working really well. Uh, for me. And in the end, um, ideas are nothing, doing is everything. I, you know, being in the creative community, you always hear people talk about great ideas. I have this idea for a book, I have idea for uh, uh, you know, this video, I have idea for this blog. There's so many great ideas, but then not actually everyone ended up doing the, the ideas that they came up with. As Armin talked about, you know, it's all about making it happen and the reason why you do it is because it's fun to do it. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you.